Now, Jacko and I are modern day males, which means we're not afraid to talk about women's health with absolutely no experience of our own to back this up, but we're going to have a go at it. And we've got Sally Bell on, our resident doctor, third time on the podcast, she's doing well, and uh, we're going to talk about all things women's health and pretend we know what we do about, what well, we do about, no, to pretend we know what we're talking about and not put our foot in our mouth, Jacko, is that correct? And I think... <laughs> Just talk about your lady bits, Tim. It's fine, it's fine. It's not, it's clearly we're not being weird about it because we haven't made a weird intro about it. But no, uh, <laughs> but I just want to caveat it that we are, I am, we are at the limits of our comfort zone on this one. I would say because we like it, normally we're talking about some level of context, whereas we, let's not pretend that we know yeah. what we're talking about. That's why I'm trying to be honest yeah. and transparent. Yes, luckily someone that does know what they're talking about uh, and is completely comfortable talking about it because she knows what she's talking about is the expert. I say, Sally, self self proclaimed um, and appointed. I'm now surely I'm the I'm the. Uh, I'm, I'm the yeah. resident doctor at the scorecast, she said when she uh, uh, came on this podcast for the third time, and rightly so. Um, yes, no, fantastic podcast again. Love talking to Sally at any point, let alone um, on a podcast when you get to pick her brain for a whole uh, hour. You should. Uh, we should probably have to pay a lot of money to do that, really. But uh, we get to do it, we get to do it for free, and you all get to uh, benefit from the wisdom that she has. So yeah, no, you will enjoy this one. A lot to take away and. Uh, a little bit of something for everyone, as uh, as always with Sally. Now, and we've got some, before we get yes, other things to talk about. Yeah, well, just before we get started, that uh, some of you will be more interested in your training bits rather than your lady bits. Um, and uh, if you are, <laughs> if you are, uh, we've got online and uh, in person workshop options. There's a six week mobility course. Uh, with me and coach Georgie starting every Tuesday uh, on the 5th of April for six weeks. Come and join for that. There's only a few places remaining, I believe, as we record this, uh, but we're a bit ahead of time. So just yeah, get get yourself involved in that. And then two workshops in person. We're coming to uh, Scotland, Timbo, Good Scotland, Bunny Scotland. In, uh, we're going to Edinburgh uh, on the 30th of April. So get yourself involved in that one. And then there is the 14th of May. We will be in Liverpool. Uh, that was Liverpool for those that can't understand my Scouse accent. And the other one was Scotland for those that couldn't understand that. Excellent. Right. Let's dive into podcast number three, all about women's health with Dr. Sally Bell. Roll that jingle. Listen, players, <laughs> you're listening to the Movement, Strength and Play podcast by the School of Calisthenics. Here are your hosts, Tim and Jacko. So it is a welcome back, 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 probably. I don't know. I've, every We've lost count how many times we've had Sally Bell onto the podcast. But Sally, welcome back, 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 back. Very glad to be back. I, I hope now I do have the title of school doctor. I hope nobody <laughs> yes. wrestle me off my po- podium and for being school of calisthenics doctor. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Um, and you are you have been busy um, delving more into an area that myself and Tim, by our uh, masculinity, um, don't have any personal experience of being a woman or women's health and how that affects us, everything from our health and well-being oh. to training. Um, Maybe not first-hand experience. I've got some second-hand experience. Exactly. We've, yeah. <laughs> is that, is that what you call it? Second-hand? I don't know. If that, I don't know. I don't know. Here we go. Maybe. <laughs> well, I've observed it in, in, in women. Good. And I've asked, I've asked intelligent questions. I'm, I'm, I'm here to participate in this conversation, Jack. I don't trust oh, I'm here to listen. I'm, not going I'm, here to purely, I'm purely here to listen. I wanna, I'm, yeah, oh, right, what let's get do in. I want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I oh. want to know what you want to talk about in relation to um, women's health. Oh, so, um, yes, I mean, to set the scene, you know, we've been on this journey before and... Yeah talked about how um you know i've been a conventional gp for 22 years but about 10 years ago started look upstream and developed a style of practice that instead of focusing on diseases started focusing you know on why people are unwell and personalizing healthcare. and 
looking at some of the key foundations that underpin health and and in the process like have fallen back in love with medicine you know have a lovely private clinic where i see people get well um and in that journey i think what i started to realize and only you know in the last two or three years it might come as a bit of a surprise um just how there is a lack of data around women and how so much of our understanding of health our research our understanding of disease is really rooted on the study of the white male um and then you know and, and it was a real revelation for me as i started to dig deeper you know started going upstream again and looking at studies and looking at where some of our ideas have come from for disease you know for example i think there's a a statistic uh, seven out of eight women present atypically when they have a heart attack and it's like well well maybe it's because actually women present differently all the research is on men so it's not yeah. that atypical it's that we're taught how to diagnose heart attacks in men and we're not taught how to diagnose um, heart attacks in women and so this was kind of bubbling on in me and just i suppose being a woman as well and having my own health journey um, just realize the lack of data there that's specific to women um, in anything, understanding disease, drug treatment. Um, and, so, and so then emerged this kind of move towards specializing more and more in, in women's health and recently starting a new platform um, looking at how women can recover their health um, online. Sally, just for the people who are, who are listening, um, I just answer a question for me as to why research and is not conducted on female participants or why yeah. do we not have that data because actually people would be like well, why don't we know that but it's, it's in it's in the design of research papers right and how yeah. research studies yeah so it sometimes you have to go back really historically so um you know you could go back to sort of greek times and aristotle where actually our thinking around the body has always been very male and, um, you know, we were, as women, we were kind of seen as your bits on the inside of us. Like we, were, we weren't considered separate or individual or unique. And so I think like even coming into our culture and in the history of medicine being very male dominated and the study of men, um, you know, that's what kind of sets the ground work when you start looking at kind of the last sort of 50, 60 years of how research has sort of progressed on. Um, and then, you know, you've got, you know, big things where, you know, you may remember the thalidomide scare and the, well, not scare, horrific um, situation where thalidomide was given to pregnant women for anti-sickness. And then we had all of these thousands of children born with deformities um, in the 70s. And, and, and suddenly there was this, right, no women of childbearing age can be in studies. And so suddenly we were excluded and then only women that were represented were either post-menopause, um, you know, uh, and so there was a skew there, there was a fear there. Um, and then what happens is that when you progress research, you know, a lot of places outside of the UK, the UK is really lagging behind, have recognised this as an issue only in the last sort of 10 years and pushing to have women represented in studies. Um, but a lot of, you know, research, they build research on previous research, you know, you build your hypothesis on what's already done. And because women have been excluded, it makes it just complicated to start including women. And then some researchers are just like, well, women are too complicated, like, you know, our hormones are changing all the time. Um, you know, ha and when you do a study, you know, to be successful, you freeze everything, don't you? And you change one thing. Mm. And and uh, and the thing is, with the complexity of the female body, is that it's very different. And so, I think there's an underrepresentation there. But more than that, even where women are represented, we don't get sex specific information. Um, we just kind of get blobbed into everything that's going on. And the conclusion is then, you know, um, you get an overall recommendation instead of splitting the sexes and actually studying women for particular diseases, not just female health issues, but any disease. Oh, that's a significant flaw in, in our research practices doesn't it in terms of like we, we often mm. hold research up and academia up as being the guiding light and the the most intelligent in society and yeah. it's actually fundamentally flawed at so many levels when they say a study showed that yeah. xxx yeah or oh, yeah. a thousand men yeah. like might have yeah. might have shown that but even within that it's uh, it frustrates me when because you're very much an applied practitioner as as i am in a very different field but i, I still like i the value of that 
embracing the complexity and not allowing ourselves to reduce things down to these individual components which may or may not make a difference in somebody else yeah it's a, it's a, the, like someone was saying it to me is like there's still value in campfire tales yeah. if understanding the one mm. the one thing that happened how did that happen and why did it happen and we have to just be a little bit okay with not knowing everything and not yeah. being able to control everything yeah I think it's really, really important to understand that science is the pursuit of truth. It isn't the truth. And, and I am probably as tired as you of seeing people beating the shit out of each other with their research papers. And, and what you get then is people just disengaging from the scientific commu community because they're so um, tired of seeing everybody disagree. And I, and I think like we need to bear in mind that it is the pursuit of, change, of truth, that there are things changing and we need to have a very sort of um, broad holistic view as we approach these things. And we need to understand we bring so much bias, like I'm always going to be pro nature and, and I bring that when I look at research and, and so it's so much more than just what the paper says, it's who the researchers are, it's how it's funded, it's who's represented it, pre represented from a male and female thing. And I think as a clinician, when I um, have a patient in front of me, research just plays like a part of the, um, a part of the decision making. Like I have my, is it scientifically plausible? You know, um, my, what my intuition says about this patient, what the patient wants, what their beliefs are, as well as, you know, my clinical acumen from working for 20 years that I draw from. And then science informs into that, research informs into that. And it is this like, gosh, we need to have some big conversations instead of making everything so small and about what the research says. It's like, like life is bigger than that. We need to hold these things in tension and walk together as we pursue wholeness and healing. Yeah. We, it's, it's diff yeah, go on, Jacko. I was going to say, we actually had a, a, a conversation a little bit like this the other day where... Um, it, it, it's it's definitely not just because just because a study or a research has been done doesn't make it like and people just use the word like science and like we joke about it like literally an anchor man like it's it, it people make jokes of it but it happens of going like if i've conducted a study on a small number of participants that is to prove my idea or my product right like that isn't science just because you had a scientific paper to prove that like because actually as you said so like the pursuit of the truth and understanding that we all have some we're trying to test a hypothesis so you could you can't not have some level of bias but appreciating that level of bias um yeah. is certainly important um mm. something so if you if if we're starting off at that point of going like there hasn't been there's complexity to um studying females female health how the body works because we've got a lot of different changes or more complexity than the male does and therefore there is a lack of research but where where, where are we at now with it and when i say we i don't mean me i say mean you in the scientific <laughs> i'm going like so going past appreciate going get we're going past like Okay, there are some differences, and there must have been some dust done. What What are some of the sort of like highlights for people to start to to, to think about from a top level, and we can think, dig in. I think, um, I think what's irrefutable is the explosion of research on just how different the female body is at every level, at a cellular level, muscular level, anatomical level, like um, all of those levels, like and, and physiologically and and how we present, you know, sort of in disease, it's just, it's irrefutable, like we are different. And, but there is still a massive sort of gender data gap to catch up, um, you know, with research actually looking at that and considering that and um, personalizing it to um, the, the female body. Um, and I, and I think, so, so I think like at the moment we're in that difficult, period where there's an awareness but there aren't the solutions and so it's a horrible time to have a conversation because it's not like i can go hey we're there like you know that there you know it, it, it you know the the cogs are starting to turn and and things are starting to happen to address these issues um and i think it's it, i think just one of the things i say now and things i've learned so much as a medical practitioner 
um, you know, with women is, you know, trust yourself. Like, don't be put off because you don't fit a criteria or, you know, the drug doesn't work for you and, and be made to think that there's something wrong with you. Like, you know your body. And I, and I think for practitioners where we're in this awkward time of like, well, that's great, Sally, but how on earth do I practice differently? Mm. You know, my advice is that we need to be believing people's stories. And for too long, we disregard people if they don't fit into the way that we're trained or what we think should be happening. And, and we need to start listening at, at what's going on, you know, with a person and, and respecting that and working with that instead of starting with a disease category. Mm. Yeah, I think that's and it's, it's where it gets a, it, that, it goes back to that point around that complexity of actually when you look at traditional healthcare, and I'm going to make something which might be slightly judgmental. Is it's like because it's difficult and the demand on the healthcare system, people are it, they go on the surface level information sometimes, don't they? So it, these things take a take a process to dig into. There needs to be some sort of trial error. The level of care needs to be almost greater because the contact time needs to be a bit higher. And I've I've got yeah. some context of this of of some um, some treatment and some support my my wife went through a few years ago. Mm. But it's 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 these things aren't quick fixes, are they? But the the, the National Health Service in the UK. Yeah. let's be fair to them like do an amazing job but they just yeah. don't have the resource to be able to necessarily dive into the complexity that's sometimes going on is that fair to say yeah i think totally like the nhs is absolutely fabulous for specialized care and um, for trauma you know i always say you know if you landed in a and e you know you don't want me standing over you talking to you about broccoli and sleep like you want that <laughs> nepotist you, know, you, want, you, know, you want that surgeon like they are fantastic at what they do but when you look at the problem of chronic disease and chronic disease is everything from your Alzheimer's, your autism, your cancers, your um, respiratory diseases, heart diseases, diabetes, obesity, you know, this whole massive spectrum of diseases, um, you know, sort of 80 to 90 percent are to do with our lifestyle. And, and we have a system that knows how to treat acute things and knows how to medicate things. Now, lifestyle problems require lifestyle solutions, and mm. it is totally ludicrous to think that we can keep medicating it. Um, and so we do need a different system that starts looking at lifestyle issues and then that whole difficult thing of helping people change. And we know just like a bit of information doesn't change anyone, we need to coach. You know, we need health yeah. coaches, we need people you know, in groups, we need that kind of tribe sort of a mindset to make some changes to our lifestyle to help um, recover our health. Um, yeah. So, yes, you need a very different system. And that's why it's failing. And like in my private clinic, I have an hour with patients and and people say, well, that's great. We just don't have that time. But let me tell you, that patient will keep coming back to the GP, you know, again and again. And in that hour, I can sort out a huge amount and then actually my health coaches often will then take that person with the plan and make those changes. And so although people go, it's just not efficient having all of that time, I think it is because we, it stops all this kind of repeat, you know, presentation and, um, you know, and actually gets to the heart and the root of what's going on. And then, you know, stops the billions of pounds that we're spending on medication, much of which people don't take. Um, and and so so yeah, I think you know we do have to find uh, and address these issues around finding a better system. Yeah, I think it it, all, it it sounds so obvious. A couple of things where you go, men and women are different, and therefore, like their health needs are different. And if anyone's ever met someone of the opposite sex and spent some time with them, you'll know that they're <laughs> that they're that we're different. Um, and then the the idea that the phrase there you said of like lifestyle problems need lifestyle solutions mm -hmm. again when you put when you say it in a phrase like that it's just it sounds so obvious i think that the the drive for that change i think we all feel in is in is happening i think that the solution for it i think no one necessarily probably knows and it is that's outside the scope of of, of this conversation mm -hmm. for sure but in terms of what you're then what what you're trying to do, what what things you're identifying from a female health perspective that you know we will we'll have we come to a work a school class next workshop, we'll have probably fifty percent close to of the participants are are female and 
you know, a, a, a huge number or percentage of the, the our online members are female and they're doing some incredible things with their with their training. And we've had a couple of um, people on the podcast, I uh, forget her name, but the S&C coach, Tim, that was sort of uh, specialising in like training female athletes around their cycle to get like treating their cycle as like the the superpower almost of like understanding when to push it and understanding when to pull back based on that. I can't remember her name, but I'll 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 find it. I can't remember. Yes, yeah. I should get. Um, it's worth to listen back because we could yeah. that sort of stuff in, in a lot of detail. Yeah, and we can go wide. You can you know your special like go go wider in terms of like general because if someone's healthier generally they're going to perform better in training and recover better. So we can, we can go wide with it. But what, yeah, what are you trying to do rather than let's, rather than us trying to give some suggestions for the NHS? Yeah, yeah. no, no. I think like, you know, um, I always try to keep it simple and regardless of your sex, you know, there's some key things that you can be doing that will just radically change, you know, your health, your experience of life and that of your family. And, you know, that is, you know, adequate sleep, it's aggressively managing our stress, you know, it's being active, not just training, you know, but if you're sitting all day, you need to address that. It's about connection with self, others, and, you know, that sense of purpose, and it's, you know, about eating. And I say the big food messages are eat real food, eat less than you think, and eat together, and it will totally transform your life if you just follow some of those principles. But I think particularly around women and particularly about women in their reproductive years, I think it's understanding how our hormones impact how we feel, so our mental health, how it affects our gut function, you know, how it affects our skin, um, you know, uh, how it affects um, uh, our mood. Um, and even our brain function, how it affects inflammation or our sense of pain. Like, it's realizing that, you know, our sex hormones that are fluctuating throughout the month, um, you know, do more than just, more than periods and, you know, and, and having babies. Like, our sex hormones impact nearly every area of our body. Um, and it's having an awareness of that, that I think is totally lacking generally with women. Um, not just within, you know, uh, you know, the sort of training and athletic world, but just generally this idea that, you know, it affects all aspects of our body, as well as, you know, in the medical profession. So I, I think, you know, there's the basics that I would always tap into, but then it's about personalising it even further um, and considering and teaching women, women about how their hormones affect how they feel, their skin, their gut, their brain, so they're not thinking they're crazy that they can like in training harness the time when their testosterone peaks and they can build muscle when their progesterone peaks so therefore they're better at, at doing endurance work you know there's, there's things like that that can really yeah. help um, women just enjoy who they are that we live at a time where um, you know we're told we should always be on it you know great in bed great at work great at everything and there's probably about three or four days in the month where hormonally we're wired to live like that but there's other times in the month where our body changes and, and we need to live a different way and have some respect for that so we know how to harness the brilliance of what of the changes that are happening in our body so is the big step around this then Sally is it is the first step around education is that where we where we can begin and I guess yeah. that kind of links into a little bit about what you're doing with your platform now and, and to yeah. support this because there's probably lots of questions that Jack and I don't know if there was a woman sat on this, this uh, in podcast with us now they'd be like oh I've got friends who do x y and z but Jack and I probably sat there going like um <laughs> so <laughs> where do we where do where can how's it begin because it, it strikes me there's so much going on it's kind of yeah. going there's not one thing that people need to do there's going to yeah. be an educational process of understanding yeah. and, and then application to yourself yeah. right yeah, so I think, um, so the first thing is, is for me, the big message is how much control we have over our health, as for everybody, like this awareness and taking responsibility, you know, for these lifestyle choices and, and realising how much control we have over being healthy and or heading towards that sort of root of disease. So, so leaning into that and learning and equipping ourselves. And then I think the next layer for me is that as women just having this awareness and starting to have this discussion that there is nothing wrong with us we are not a deviation from a norm we are not a little man like actually harnessing and understanding you know how our hormones impact us through the different eras of our life um, and learning to celebrate 
that and live with that so it is an awareness piece and um you know one of the things i've done is like um i hate that i have a private clinic because i don't I find it really difficult to charge people and and my passion has always been to i just do it's just this nhs thing that is ingrained in us and um and so one of my passions has always been to provide a platform you know where people can get this information that's safe and sensible and not weird and wonderful and um you know well some of it might seem a bit weird and wonderful to some but and so i've created my new platform dr sally women's dot health um where i'm starting to uh create courses pertinent to particular health issues i've started with the perimenopause um, but my next one's on mental and emotional health for women um, and then gut health for women and, and i'm trying to just with each one just unpick what the evidence is out there um, and then start looking at lifestyle and how to personalize that alongside conventional medicine like you know I, i'm pro that it's a brilliant thing but just trying to give women some tools to help them on their health journey um so yeah can i ask a question from a, from a man's perspective yes um so it, it's maybe double pronged as a father to a one-year-old and i appreciate she's got some growing to do before i've got to worry about too much of this <laughs> sort of stuff but I'd, let me prepare in advance because it may there may be other challenges along the way um what 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 can i do from a male's perspective to support facilitate from that from if i've got a daughters yeah. in my life yeah. and and also for, as a husband yeah. to to guide yeah. and and be a be a positive voice influence uh supporter whatever it might require in, the, in this conversation yeah i mean i think with any of the kids the greatest gift you'll ever give is that they know that they love the rest of the stuff they can sort out they can get a good psychotherapist and other when they're <laughs> like, really really like just you know having a father figure that is totally championing her um in whatever she wants to do and pursuing what's in her heart i think is the greatest gift um as with your wife it would be the same thing you know I, and i think like as women we we have some voices in our head we we we're afraid of our voice we don't feel believed we don't feel heard um and so i think to have voices around that call us to trust our intuition to trust ourselves we know what we need we know but we don't always know how to voice it and we don't have confidence in it so so really if you're fathering or you know in your partner it's it's you know getting getting us as women to trust ourselves because that has been robbed from us for decades and centuries and we as women are starting to find our voice so i think there's an element around that is the key um and then you know i do think it, it would be savvy for you to um understand how our hormones change through the month and how that impacts us as women um you know just a quick example would be you know uh that first week after our period you know our estrogen starting to rise and and in that time we're more likely to get our to-do list and we're you know we're on it and um feeling a little bit invigorated mid cycles that time where we want to host the hut the parties sex drive is amazing like we feel like goddesses you know the week after before our period as progesterone rises which is you know it's a call to us to step back um to be more self-reflective we're more self-aware and that's the time what we might be more irritable but it's more because we think we should be living like mid-cycle if we could just accept that actually it's a gift um you know that intuition that comes about and then during the period you know it's a time to rest and eat and nurture and feed our body ancient cultures we would have all have disappeared in a, in a tent and just you know had a girly time you know for a whole week and not done anything so mm -hmm. you know i think just understanding that and then allowing a woman to be able to live in response to that um can be just hugely helpful and when i say woman i just mean biological female i don't want to exclude anybody and it does get more complicated when people transition and take male hormones but you know it's still it's for anybody you know that has these female hormones going through their body just you know allowing allowing that and respecting that and um and not expecting us to be like you where everything's steady um hormonally <laughs> i think there's some interesting stuff there particularly around the 
the history and uh, um, particularly around how uh, that conditioning around not being heard and having a mm-hmm. voice and how that kind of affects the the mental state uh, in yeah. a lot of women. And uh, yeah. just as a slight, this is a joke before I kind of take it seriously. <laughs> I need to understand that hormonal cycle so I can know when I can pack some muscle on Naomi when she's big enough. <laughs> Basically, that's that mid cycle. It's when you need to testosterone peaking. That's the time to do your muscle stuff. <laughs> and then the endurance stuff is premenstrually when that uh, when that progesterone is starting to rise because it impacts how we use our energy and it's amazing it's totally phenomenal when you but start it, looking at it. The conversations coming like I've seen it happen in the last few years, particularly in sport, where like I think as men we probably get uncomfortable around the, 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 some of these conversations. But this sort of stuff in sport, particularly as as people have started to kind of come out, it's Debbie Sargent, Jacko was That's the, the S and C coach that we had on before, who did done a lot of work in this area, trying to sort of get the um, get the message out there, but that we need to be start to writing training programs differently and structuring programs and, and plans differently for female athletes. It's very it's becoming much more comfortable for S and C coaches, the guy in the gym, to be having conversations about what part of the cycle your athletes are yeah. in, and, yeah. I, and I think that's that's a high performance environment. So it's these there's different kind of behaviors, I guess, that, that come with that. But yeah. I think yeah, why do we not like do, how many men out there? I'm thinking for myself, I can know exactly at what point my wife or their wives or partners yeah. are in their in their cycle, and therefore what's potentially happening. Like if we actually just were a little bit more kind of like less afraid. Like, <laughs> I'm more curious then that yeah. would be like and but if, if I, I'll, I need to go and remember these things so like you said these different kind of cycles and go right okay well roughly where are we at and I did that, that I just for me kind of just strikes as a really easy win yeah. to make yeah. home life a little bit easier yeah. and then if you're seen to be supporting during those times where they have got those different kind of behaviors and characteristics then that yeah. just is surely going to lead to better relationships and yeah, yeah. I and I think again, that those teenage girls, you know, when you girls you reach that teenage time, it gives you a grace and understanding, and it helps them be mm. more self-accepting. And you know, especially now when uh, you know our teenagers are just bombarded with these images of how they should be living, um, I think to help us understand how our bodies are wired, and then living in celebration of that. Um, you know, but it's, it's removing taboo and like making it normal, isn't it? We've got to yeah. normalise mm. some of this stuff and, and stop yeah. seeing it as difficult conversations to have. Mm. It's just, this yeah. is, it's, it's almost like respecting, as you said, that the yeah. bodies are different. And yeah. why can we not talk about this stuff? Yeah. Because everyone knows it's happening, right? Yeah. It's like, it's not, it's not and then, you know, a secret. I think, and I think for you guys, like, you've got a, an older demographic, you know, people in their 40s are now training and, mm. and interested in this type of thing. And like, as women, the perimenopause can be anything from three months to 10 years and can start in your early 40s. And at that point, you lose that lovely cycling that's predictable and your hormones are all over the place. And so I think, again, you know, as PTs and as trainers, having an awareness of women in their reproductive years is helpful. But then, oh, my goodness, what do you do when you hit perimenopause? Because we as women don't have any awareness of this. Like, it is completely a taboo subject and um, something that really is changing. Um, and so, so again, the, how that must impact training is, is huge. Yeah. There's, I, I want to pick, this, pick up on something and then ask you... A, potentially a difficult question but I, I don't know it might be maybe that, that people have the answer but the first, to pick up on something that's irrelevant of male or female that um actually we've had um, a couple of amazing um female guests on the podcast recently um daria albers said about she's a, a female ex-pro kickboxer is now she's a coach um and one thing she gives all of her fighters that she says is the most important thing was unconditional love mm. and what you said then what you said to, to Tim of like what what in answer to his question like what can he do and he said make sure that make ensure that they know that they're loved you know can you expand a little bit on because I had a private conversation with you last week where you said you have two types of patients one and not male and female you said they either know that they're loved or they don't and the ones that know that they're loved, there is just a dramatic difference. Just expand on that before I then ask you a difficult question. <laughs> just put me on the spot. So, but that's yeah, not, because that's no of male nor female, yeah? No, no. So, you know, after 22 years and of, of working with patients and really desiring to help them make 
um, habit changes. Uh, I've always kind of dug a bit deeper of how people are wired. And I think the science is there to report, you know, to support it as well. There's a lovely guy, Gabor Mate and Brené Brown's work. It, it all reflects the same thing that when you grow up with a sense that you know your value and you know that you're loved, um, you know, I can ask my patients to make any changes and, you know, with a bit of support they can. And what I've found, though, is that, that actually a lot of people can't make changes because they don't know how to love themselves. They don't feel loved. They don't feel valued. And I would say, sadly, like probably that is the majority um, of the cases where the majority of people, even if they don't consider they had a traumatic childhood, when sadly there's a lot of people with traumatic childhoods, you know, they have this lack of, of self-worth. And I think it's more dominant in women anyway. And, and, and actually, for me to then load them up with a program or, you know, try and get some changes, it's almost like I'm compounding because they, they, they can't self-care because, it, because it's like it, it, they, can't, they, they don't know how to. And so what we have to do is, is I work with an amazing psychotherapist, Michelle McCulley, and um, you know, I'll often send my patients to work with her to kind of dig deeper to get to that root of what is lying, you know, at the heart of that, um, and and building that sense of self care. And then once people have a sense of self worth, I can ask them to do anything. Um, so so that's why I totally, utterly believe that the greatest gift I can give my kids, I get loads wrong, um, you know, is that I know. That, that, that they know that they're loved and, and championed and cherished. And, and, and if I can get through life and give them that gift, honestly, anything else you can sort out when you're an adult. It's interesting. I, I saw a clinical psychologist speak uh, the other week, and he said, it was talking about um, something a little bit similar to this, but around um, strength and vulnerability in men. It was kind of like, we often talk about that in, in women, but like, what does that look like from a male yeah. perspective? And he was talking about, like he said, that the, the quality of your, your personal relationships at 50, above anything else that you're going to do in your life, the, the most important thing is the quality of your relationships at 50 will determine how likely you are to be alive at 80. Like wow. the, yeah. uh, the, this, the, I think he's, he, he's, like, he's got two, H, two PhDs, so I'm assuming that's backed up um, pretty well. But it makes sense, right? Like, that's a similar sort yeah. of thing, like knowing, knowing that you've got that yeah. community and that network of people yes. around you yeah. is actually significant on how healthy mm -hmm you're going to be or, yeah. or yeah. Like so I, talk about, I talk about one of my um, foundations being connection to self connection to others and connection to a sense of purpose and there's great research to support that you know our social isolation drives disease it's a more potent driver of disease than you know, kind of your smoking and your you know your diabetes and so so it's so so, so destructive social isolation and and social isolation doesn't always mean that you're on your own it means that you're not connecting in a vulnerable and meaningful way um and so and so totally like um it is so important that we're loving ourselves that we're in relationships where we can be vulnerable and supported um and as well as being connected to sort of nature and purpose we see as well you know really good evidence that that when we lose a sense of purpose we give up and uh, but uh, and we can often get ill you often see it with couples you know one dies in their older age mm. and the other will die months later and having had no disease and it's almost they've lost their sense of purpose mm. and, and I think in the blue zones you know when you look at those areas where they live the longest one of the pieces of research shows that whether they're 20 or 100 they know why they get up in the morning uh, and how important purpose is and that connection and to something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask my difficult, ask you a difficult question, Jack. Yeah, uh, it might, I don't know if it is or not. It was, um, but we, we, we go, you, were, you were going into some level of detail around like the female cycle. And this is where my um, extensive knowledge of the female cycle is going to, to stop um, yeah. or, or start and stop is that Obviously, there is uh, to do around reproduction. Um, do we know why it is cyclical? Like, why is it a cycle? Why is it not just, um, you know, like a bloke can get a boner whenever they want, normally when they're on the bus and it's a bit inappropriate? 
It's the vibrations or whatever it may be. No one's ever said that on the podcast before. That's the first hey, look, thing anyone's ever look, said. Look, the other week, I said dickhead because someone else... I did. <laughs> said, uh, the, uh, you'd like, you need to listen to uh, Sally. Oh, no, obviously you listen to the, um, the podcast every week, Sally. But, um, so you'll have enjoyed Santina who, who said, you, can, you, should, you should never trust anyone that can't dance. Um, um, and she has this it's notion of you can't dance properly it's just that you're willing to look like a dickhead when you dance yeah she was like context. me and my husband she's Australian me and my husband we've got this thing we just dance like a dickhead it's just what you need to do Jacko <laughs> anyway which I have been doing for quite some time um, no yeah well, my, so my question do, do we know why it's why it is in a cycle does so anyone have any theories or no, but I think everything in nature has a cycle. I mean, it is just, you, there's not a thing that you can't take. You know, seasons, seeds, like everything is cyclical in life. Like, mm. it's the very essence of how we're created. And we, you know, the very life and death is a cycle. You know, we, we come from the ground and we end up in the ground. Like, um, so, so I think, you know, that's, that's what it's like. And then, and then that, that female part is all about preparation. So I think the thing is with the cycle is, you know, there's a whole host of things going on to get ready for the incredible miracle and mm. privilege you can to have a baby. Yeah. And, you know, and so, and it's, and it, and it, and the, the, the science is beautiful and stunning of all the things that are going on to make that happen. Um, you know, and and then the wonderful gift that we get more than just once to have a go and do that, like you know, and, yeah. and uh, you know, cycles will depend on whatever animal it is, you know, in terms of the length of cycles. So, I don't I don't know why, but I imagine it's just to stay continuously fertile like that. So I don't know. Then maybe do other animals do, do other animals all have that have male and female? Do other animals have? Do the females have cycles as well? So, ma- all mammals will have cycles and require a male and a female to be able to make a baby and the cycle length varies um you know and the uh, between species so and um as well as how long it takes to make a baby animal so for an elephant it's like two years you know they're pregnant i think or something like that and for us it's nine months and then they can only get pregnant at certain times of a year where we would be every month usually so Mm. yeah um, you say gift. I haven't slept for a year. Ah! Like a gift. <laughs> She's just turned one and she doesn't sleep. So I, <laughs> she, it was a birthday last week, um, or this week actually, on Tuesday. And I was like, it's that 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 moment we go three hundred and sixty-five nights. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing! What a gift. <laughs> it is a gift. Um, uh, someone said on a different point uh, I think Jack might have told me I've quoted you to me Sally um, well, I've heard you say this before about like how the detrimental side of, of have missing a night's sleep or having a bad night's sleep uh, can be yeah. on your health well I've had 365 so I, I literally I, mean, I feel like death right now you're so just doing great to be here mate life. you're just doing it's just like <laughs> So how, how, how do we navigate this? Is like not at all women's health. At all. Well, I guess it is women's health because like Corin does more of the feeding than, than, than I do. So she's had even worse sleep than I have mm-hmm. in the last 365 days. Yeah. Talk to me about that because I need some encouragement. Yeah, I think it's the cost of having children. That's okay, what we so we, we, do we lose some years because we have children? Is that how it Thank works? Because we... if you... I'm going to live forever. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I reckon if you track your glycan age, your biological age, um, during the time that you have young children, we would lose some, we would gain, would lose some years. So, um, so yeah, but so you've then got children to look after you when you're old and knackered, whereas I'm just going to yeah. like rot on my own. No. Can we gain those years back through personal connection and love? Yeah, so that's a really <laughs> interesting question. Like when yeah. you look at the the, um, the sleep science generally you can't undo crappy sleep the, dam- the damage it's done but on the whole when you look at age sort of sci- anti-aging science um yes lifestyle can reverse your biological age so i had my biological age tested recently 12 weren't you 12 years old go on get hit us so i'm 47 and my biological age was 26 so i get was in. Like, get in there you don't look okay. a day over 25 sally 
Mm. So I, it's like I can't, I can't be doing any more of this lifestyle stuff. I'll end up a teenager. <laughs> Benjamin, oh, ben, female version Benjamin Button over here. <laughs> it's the female Tim. <laughs> Peter Pan. So, that's the thing, right? I, I don't want to die early. Like, I, but then I've got, now I've got kids and kind of can't do anything about it. I, we can't make her sleep. Like, no. she just doesn't, she doesn't, she's not, she's not having it. Well, on a separate, on a separate note, with similar quote from Sally Bell, when I said, yeah. it's my birthday in May, she said, oh, you're 50th. Are you having a big party? <laughs> I knew it was your fault. And I'm surprised you even got invited back on the podcast. <laughs> For the record, I'm 30 in May. Plus uh, 10. <laughs> yeah. But saying that, you haven't got any grey hair, Tim, from all your sleepless nights, where I don't know what, what causes uh, Zacco's grey hair. Um, I started going grey when I was 20 at uni. Snake bite and black, I think, is it's what just, it is. You, you can't see them underneath. That's why I have a skin fade now, because you get rid of the ones on the sides. Yeah. I, think, I actually think I'm going to look quite a good grey. I think I'm going um, gonna, 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 gonna to pull it off. So I'm not too worried about it. I'm going to look debonair. <laughs> um, well that has been something on my mind that I was like am I actually because we've had kids quite late I'm 40 and I was just turned one I was like how many good years have I got left so I want to kind of maximise the years we've got but she, currently she's like she's cutting me short isn't she <laughs> <laughs> she's like she's trying to do me in already get out <laughs> dad get gone <laughs> welcome to the world of young children yeah I'm not having any more oh it will it will pass so mine are 16 14 and 12 now i really enjoy this these these years i like the teen years i didn't like pre the preschool years nearly died i was just like oh it's awful um but then you've had three right so here we go so your biological age is 27 you're yeah. 47 years old you've had yeah. three kids so yeah. your the theory has got to be like you're yeah. now unless you're n of one yeah though the theory yeah. of like three you've had three lots of sleepless yes periods no. And you're still doing all right. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to take that as encouragement. I am. And I didn't really get into lifestyle medicine and nutrition until 10 years ago. So, yeah. about, you know, so I just think that's the amazing, amazing thing about the power we have over our health um, is that we can make changes at any age and reap the benefits. Like we can change the direction we go and we can slow down aging. Um, and as we slow down aging, we slow down disease. So it's brilliant. It's amazing. Listen, I'm glad we finished on like a relatively because it, yeah. it started out quite serious, didn't it? I f I'm glad we found our way to a jovial. <laughs> I'm going to say climax, but in the context of the conversation that we talked about, boners and climax. Yeah, you can't say climax. Like, you oh, I just said it. <laughs> well, you can't. You can't say boner. That's what you said. Anyway, I'm glad that we've 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 met a, we've we've achieved a, a good crescendo. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Sally, thank you for coming on. I always enjoy our chats. It's uh, yes. always enlightening and encouraging. So thank you again for coming to share that. And, and just tell people where they can find it. If they are interested in, in finding out more about you and women's health, just give us your, your, your links and information again. Yeah. So um, for my new women's health platform, oh, please follow me on social media because I've started from scratch. So that's DRS Women's Health. Um, so that would be marvellous to get that going. And then my new uh, website that's got loads of free information and ebooks and courses um, is drsallywomens.health. Um, and my old website for more generic stuff is still drsallybell.com. So you can still get me there. Amazing. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Are we going to do class dismissed? We don't do that anymore. Oh, yeah, no, we do. Yeah. Well, we do, but we've changed it. So. No, yeah, but but we can let Sally do it. Do you know what? Seeing as she's been on a few, why don't we just do the outro now, Jacko, and then Sally can, and then then the, also the benefit is the production department has one less edit to yeah. do. Because she's been, she's quite part of the furniture now anyway. She's like resident doctor, so yeah. we can say what we like in front of her. What's new? Well, no, you we, just, we, you, we yeah, no, it's not. You get to say, you get to say class dismissed at the end. There you we go. took that away from we took that away from the guests. We were basically yeah. doing an outro separately. Yeah, mm. well, that's that's why I came on. To we don't need to exactly. Bit. Well, do the do the outro, Jack, because I think we. To be honest, it sounds like we're not on a podcast anymore, just having a chat. So we probably need to kind of people are still listening. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody yeah. was still wondering, <laughs> well, I hope so. Wrap it up and then yeah. she can then, then see Sally up. Yeah, it's a pause. I'm not editing it. <laughs>
<laughs> you go straight in. Are you not editing? You're not even editing. I'm not cutting it out. This is the. Okay, me. no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, keep that going. I was just me. like gathering the, my the, thoughts. I was going to. I was going to. Right. The production department don't want us to do any more editing. <laughs> so, as a special. Um, what, did, what was it? Uh, why can't I think of. I can't, Climax. Climax. <laughs> <laughs> Outro, I think is what I'm thinking about. With actually <laughs> Sally still here rather than us doing it separately. Sally, if uh, what's give us uh, give us one one tip, two tips, or three, whatever you want. Give us a key because normally we would wrap up some key takeaways. I want you Briefly, to give us your key brief. takeaway. Oh. Headlines. What's your key okay, takeaway? Headline. The key takeaway is: as women, believe in yourself. We don't have to fit into any box. Um, trust your voice and look me up. <laughs> Hit me up. <laughs> Follow you on social Hit media. Hit me up. Follow me on TikTok. I'm good at dancing. <laughs> dancing like a dickhead on TikTok. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much, Sally. Until and to keep, oh, we've got we added another bit in that you don't know about as well. But until next time, keep exploring your physical potential with movement, strength, and play. Sally, now you can say class dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>